Cabaret gums of uh, intensely connected with people and, and the stories that I heard, trees cropped up in their stories at various milestones during people's lives. So one person told me of a very moving story about um, how their father's ashes were laid to rest under a river red gum. Other people told me of getting married under river red gums. In fact, along the Todd River in Alice Springs. I know of other stories of Aboriginal women giving birth to their children under a river red gum, using the, the trunk of the tree to, to brace themselves against during childbirth. So, you know, at one level you can think of, when you tell stories like that, you think of the tree as witness to hatching, matching and dispatching. But th there's far more to it than that. People relate to these trees. They're, they're part of the landscape in which they are familiar with. And often they have these very intense spiritual attachments to, to that landscape and that place. And when you're relaying those stories, it sounds like for people, it wasn't just that these events happened under a tree, they happened under a river of red gum. That's a very distinct part of, of their memory, of their, their recollection. So what does that tell you about Australia's connection to the species? Okay, well, river red gum occurs in parts of the landscape where there is either water on the surface or not far beneath the surface. And often that's in parts of the country where they're the only trees in that landscape. Beyond uh, a fringe of, of uh, river red gum, there might be arid shrubland or saltbush or whatever. So the trees stand in that landscape to signify water and therefore life. And so they take on that extra significance because of their relationship with water. And I think that's the, the real essence of, of what River Red Gum stands for and what it's really about and why people relate to it. It's an indicator of water and provides that shade and shelter and habitat and food resources for, for other organisms. And for humans, the shade factor is incredibly important as well in landscapes where, you know, otherwise there's precious little shade to be had. Particularly here in Central Australia, and you alluded to it, to it mm. just there, but how much does the tree stand out in an arid environment and why is it so special? Um, you can pretty much, if you're driving across a, a flat, landscape in arid or central arid Australia and you can see a line of trees in the distance it's pretty certain they're going to be river red gums and they're going to be lining the banks of a, a creek or a river even if that river is dry most of the time as many of the rivers in central in fact nearly all the rivers in central Australia are but we know that there's always water just below the surface in that coarse gravel and sand that um, uh, so many central Australian rivers are, are, char are characterised by. And that's what River Red Gum gets its roots into, and, and that's its water source. That's how it um, persists in that landscape. Why did you feel compelled to write a book about the River Red Gum? Well, the first time I went into a River Red Gum forest, I knew this was a special place. I felt something I hadn't really felt before as a, a field ecologist and that was this sort of sense of reverence and sense of of peace of being in this place so I knew they were special places and I kind of thought well is that just me and I started asking around and talking to people and they said no 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 they are special and uh, a friend and colleague of mine Steve Morton said oh yeah you've got to come to Alice Springs and and see how how trees are regarded there and they're, they're really important part of, of the landscape and the environment and so so I realized that my experience was actually part of a collective experience that, that people had in relating to this particular tree and I thought that's a story worth telling. What is it about this tree that makes it so special? And it's something about its size and its familiarity and its persistence and its longevity and its sort of uh, slightly unkempt shape and, and, and shedding bark. And, but all of those things of providing shelter and food and, and signaling water is, is why people relate to it. How much do we know about the tree itself and the, how it actually works? We know the basics of its life history. We know, know the, the basics of its water requirements. But we don't know some really 
simple things like we we're not really that sure how long they live you know educated guess is around about 500 years but people have claimed that they live longer than that um, once you start to get out to you know they've claimed 900 or 1,000 years, once you start to get out to that sort of longevity, that's that's pretty extreme for, for many trees. They're not, they're not a great number of, of trees that live that long. We don't know things like, you know, how far down do its roots grow or how many of its seeds, once they germinate, survive to adulthood. And those are, those are sort of fundamental biological characteristics that uh, are very useful in being able to understand elements of population dynamics and therefore being able you know assist in in being able to make decisions about um, future management of uh, red gum forests and woodlands so we're we're still scratching the surface and that what we've what we discovered in recent times was that dotted across the country okay it's one species of river red gum eucalyptus camaldulensis but there are at least seven subspecies that have got regional uh, distinctive um, distributions they're, they're, they've got particular characteristics that uh, separate them from other subspecies and they've probably got physiological adaptations to the part of the landscape that they live in too so we're just beginning to learn 